days ahead. Uh, also, one other uh, quick word. Uh, I did not give this to Stephen for the end of the service. I wanted to kind of mention it again uh, today myself because this has not really been promoted publicly yet, but uh, if you're not familiar with, and most of you in here may be, okay, but if you're watching us online, you may not really be familiar with the kind of church we are as Parkview Baptist Church, but we are in association with the Southern Baptist Convention, which are thousands of churches across America, across the world, really. And there's two times every year that we take up special offerings, really three, but um, and to include our own state. But at the Easter time frame, we uh, take up an offering that we call the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering. And during that time, which is the time we're in now, our church goal has a goal of $6,000. Uh, I don't see Mary Ellen. I think I said that right. I think it's $6,000. We take up an offering, hopefully reaching at least $6,000 ourselves, along with all the other churches that we are in association with, to pull together money, in this case, for all of our mission work, missionaries across North America. Okay, so I encourage you uh, to give liberally and freely above and beyond what you typically give to the church uh, for that. And again, most people have heard me say this already. If you haven't, I'll just say it again. It's near and dear to my heart because I was a personal recipient of Annie Armstrong Easter offering money when I was on the eastern shore of Maryland planting churches. And so I can tell you as a living example, a living and breathing example, it's precious to be able to receive money for the work that God has called you to do and to accomplish. And it was used wisely, and I think it, was, uh, it, it brought a lot of fruit. Uh, and I still have fond memories of my day on the eastern shore of Maryland myself. But I encourage you to give, and I want to announce that as we are getting closer and closer to Easter, uh, and I hope that you will be liberal in your giving. Now, for today, we are going to continue in our series of messages that I have entitled leading up to and through Easter Sunday called Famous Last Words. Now, I'm calling it Famous Last Words because it is based on what we have commonly called the seven last sayings of Jesus while he was on the cross. And these seven last sayings of our Lord are really seven final gifts, if you will, that he is giving to us while doing the unthinkable, while literally dying on the cross, paying the penalty for the sins of mankind, where he was in incredible agony and incredible pain, agony and pain that we know nothing about and that we have never experienced to that level, he is giving gifts all the way to the end through that pain and through that kind of agony. Now, the best way to look at these seven sayings as these seven gifts is to realize again the backdrop from which they are given. They are given while Jesus is hanging on the cross, which is the cruelest, worst form of, of death ever created by man on planet Earth. And it is in that time that he is giving us these gifts. And our focus, I want you to remember this because for me, visualizing things helps me understand those things better. That Jesus in this great pain and agony where he is doing again the most momentous undertaking imaginable, the most stupendous thing anybody could have ever done. It is in the midst of all this pain, in the midst of all this agony that he utters these words. And we've looked at two of them so far. The first one was the gift of forgiveness where he in prayer at that moment on the cross, again, went to the Father and said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. His heart was still, while being illegally tried, beaten beyond our belief, scourged and his body shredded, jeered, ridiculed, mocked, insulted, and spit upon, that he would even ask God to continue to forgive mankind of their sins. The second one we looked at last week was the word or the gift of assurance. Because again, at that point, as you would imagine, you know, my mind doesn't think like that. If I'm being illegally tried, I've been beaten, I've been scourged, and everybody's still just taunting me at every level. 
My mind may not be on other people at that moment. It might be on the fact that, God, I have been unjustly treated. But then, because one of the thieves on the cross, the, the Bible would be a, a literal, a, an evildoer, expressed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, remember me when you get into your kingdom. Jesus looked at this criminal who had no track record of good in his life whatsoever, no track record of religion, he was never a church member, never a follower of God, never gave money to the church, never did any of these things that we look at and measure as being a good, faithful, church-going Christian in America. Jesus said, assuredly today you will be with me in paradise. Still with salvation on his heart to give away to others. The compassion of our Lord to me is astonishing. The care that filled his heart, the concern that was on his mind, and the provision that he continued to give in such pain is amazing. Now I want you to remember that when we get to your outline numbers three and numbers four. Because we're going to come back to that in a few moments. That that is what was on our Lord's mind in his pain. Now today we come to number three of these seven different sayings. And the one we're going to look at today, there are those who would say this about this particular saying, that it is the least theological of all of them, and yet potentially the most practical of all of them. I love it. I love practical. I love how to put things together and say, what does this look like? I would rather sit with you as a church and talk about the practical how-to of living out the love of the Lord Jesus Christ than pontificating on all kinds of theologies and living in the world of theory. Because theory must be translated into practice or else that theory is no good. The Bible was not meant to be theorized, it was meant to be practiced. And that's why I love this one so much because it's all about loving like the Lord Jesus Christ loved. So how do we love like Jesus did? The law of Jesus Christ is the law of love. And that's what we're called to do today. In John's gospel, John chapter 19, I want you to look at these three verses with me. And here we find the third of Jesus' last sayings. It begins in verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Now when we look at that and we listen to these words from our Lord, they just don't seem necessarily all that impressive. He looks at his mother and says, Behold your son, as he's referring to John being next to her or near to her. And then he turns to John and says to him, Behold your mother. Now he's not able to point because he's hanging on the cross. His hands are nailed to the, to the cross. But in some way, they knew exactly what he was saying. They knew whether they caught his eyes or the movement of his head and face. But it was very clear to her, to his own mother, that he said to her, John, he is your son from this point forward. And John knew very clearly that what Jesus was saying to him when he said, Behold your mother, he was hearing those words, Take care of her. It's many years ago that I heard similar words in a very different circumstance, of course, from my own father. Years ago, I looked at him. I said, Dad, how can we ever repay you for these kinds of things? That's too long of a story to tell you. And he simply looked at me at that point. He says, take care of your mother when I'm gone. I said, okay, we can do that. We can take care of mom. Now, it seems again like it's the least important of Jesus' words that he said from the cross. But here is the big idea for today. The big idea for us is this. We must learn to love like Jesus did. That is our calling. How do we do that? Well, if you want to look at your outline, here's how we do that. Number one, I must care for my own family. 
That's where I must start. It is an obvious beginning. This is not going to be one of those outlines that blows you away as being one of the most intellectual and astonishing outlines. It's going to be very simple. And again, that's where I love to live. I love to live in the simple and the practical. But if I'm going to love like Jesus loved me, I must care for my own family. Let me remind you of something that, again, I think you already know. And that is this. Love is not something you say. Love is something that you do. Love is not what you say. Love is found in what you do. John also said in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6 that if we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not live by the truth. In other words, if you claim to have love in your heart, I mean, if you claim to be a, a Christ follower... If you say, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm a member of Parkview Baptist Church, I'm a disciple of His, and you do not walk in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a liar. Now, just so you know, I'm not calling you a liar. The Scripture says that. I'm just repeating what I read, Rhonda, right? It says, if we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet we walk in the darkness and we walk contrary to what the Scripture teaches us, we have lied to ourselves, we have lied to others, we have deceived ourselves, and we do not live by the truth. I must care for my own family. It is my calling. It is my requirement. Now, how do we do that? Let me give you a couple things in here to, to look at. Number one, if I'm going to care for my own family, I must pay attention. Now, I want to pause right there as I talk about paying attention and summon the attention of all the men that are listening to me right now. Whether in this room, and ladies, you don't, don't check out on me. I know y'all don't. Sometimes men check out. You ladies, I'm sure y'all don't. But us men, we, our minds wander. We sometimes think of other things. A lot of times think of other things. And I say this a little tongue-in-cheek, teasing you men, but I'm one of you so I can say this and get away with it. We must pay attention. If we want to care for our own family, we must pay attention. How do you do that? You give your time. Your time investment in your family is required. It is a requirement. If, if you're going to say you love the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're going to say that you love your family, then you must pay attention to your family. You must take the time investment required to love them. How do you do that? You look towards them, you listen to them, and you turn toward them. Now, I, I mean that in every sense of the word. I mean that physically, I mean that literally, and I mean that emotionally and spiritually. You turn your attention towards your wife. You give her your attention. You give her your undivided focus. You do the same for your children. It used to be a newspaper. How many of y'all remember newspapers? Now it's a phone. Anybody's thumb just do that automatically, you know what I mean? And our children are hunting and begging and desiring our attention more than anything. And it used to be the... Everybody ever flip, flip your paper like that? You know what I'm talking about? Your newspaper, and the kid would be grabbing the newspaper. Dad, I'll be done with you, and I'll be done in a minute. But now it's this, Dad, and we don't give our attention to those that we say that we love. The greatest gift that you can give your family is the gift of respect and the gift of honor. And the way you do that is by paying attention to them, being tuned into their life. Now again, you may be listening to me right now and say, well, this is just not some, this is not a, the, the deep theological message I'd hoped for today. Well, we need to get back to practical. We need to get back to simple. Jesus in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45 said about himself, he said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you are going to be like Jesus and to serve instead of being served and to give your life to others, you must pay attention. This is why I can't wait for y'all to meet tonight in our discipleship groups. Because some of the things I have put on uh, your, the questions, the, the discussion guide on the back, it's, it's so practical, it's so helpful. I wish I could be at every group tonight. 
Uh, but then you wouldn't like that because I would probably take over and I don't need to be doing that all the time. But it's so practical. It's so much fun to me to talk about these things because, again, the best disciple... The best disciple is not the smartest man in the room or the smartest woman in the world in the room. It is the one who gets it. The best disciple is the one that pays attention and gives that love to those that are in their family. Another thing I would tell you about this is as it's our requirement to care for our own family is we just have to meet practical needs. That's what that's what the scripture tells us we must meet practical needs. Paul to Timothy in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 says this, beginning in verse 3. He says, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. This is pleasing to God. What is pleasing to God? Putting your religion into practice by caring for parents, by caring for grandparents. This is very simple. Meet practical needs. Put your faith into practice. Do you know where most ministry takes place? Most ministry takes place behind the scenes. Unannounced and unnoticed. So little ministry is performed, if that's the right word today, in public for all people to see. In other words, I would say to you, putting my religion into practice is going to gain the, please, uh, the pleasing of God in my life in other ways with my family, far more than me preaching to any amount of people publicly. It is pleasing to God to do this. And Jesus says to John basically this. He says, your love for me will be made known in your tender regard for my mother. Your love for me, Jesus says, will be known. It will be seen in your tender regard for her. Simple, yet powerful and profound. And then the other thing I would say to you about caring for your own family is this, that I must give emotional support. I must give emotional support. Let me ask you a question about Mary that we don't have time to answer today. Can you imagine what the heart of Mary was going through at that moment? I'll ask it another way too. How can sorrow and how can suffering be measured can you measure the sorrow or the suffering that someone's going through? So many people over the years have said to me as they've shared their story with me of their sorrow and their suffering or whatever you want to call it, they'll pause at some time often and say something like this to me, I know other people have it far worse than I do. And my response to them is typically this, well, I know what you're trying to say. Because it may not be a life or death situation and all that sort of thing. But here's the truth of the matter. You still must deal with your own sorrow and suffering. And I am not, I'm going to look at that person and say, I am not going to say other people have it worse than you do. I can't measure your sorrow. I don't have the ability to measure your suffering. And I'm telling you, Mary's suffering and her sorrow began, are you ready for this? Began on that day where the angel said to her, you are going to have a son. And she said, how is this going to be? Because I am a virgin. And he says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you'll give him the name of Jesus. And from that moment on, Mary had to deal with the questions of her character. The question of whether she was the right kind of girl or not. Joseph even considered it. Joseph was going to divorce her quietly until the angel convinced him that what had happened was from God. Her sorrow and her suffering began then. And then can you imagine, moms, listen to me now, ladies, it's your turn. You listen. Can you imagine giving birth to your child in a cattle stall? I can't, that The sorrow and the suffering, I cannot measure someone else's. Can you imagine then taking strips of cloth and making that the first clothing for your son and you laying your son in a feeding trough? Can you imagine that? 
And then can you imagine having to get the word again, I've got to flee, I've got to take my family and go to Egypt so I can save the life of my son? Her sorrow and her troubles and her trials began very early on and now that it is coming to this culmination at the cross... And this is why I say to you today that we are to care for our own family. We must pay attention, meet practical needs, and give the emotional support that one another needs. We are oftentimes around people who are suffering in sorrow in isolation. And until we pay attention, meet needs... And give emotional support, we'll never know anything about that. We must care for our own family. Number two is we must care for our church family. We must care for our church family. Now everything I just said about your own family, just take that and apply it to this one too. Okay? Same thing for your church family. But I want to give you some verbs, some good action verbs, because I think verbs are are good when we start talking about how do I love others? How How do I love my wife? How do I love my family? How do I love my church? They're going to come from the scripture. The first one is in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. It says, be devoted. There's your first verb. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above yourselves. Write those words down if you take notes. Devoted and honor. The scripture tells us that we are to be devoted to one another. We are to honor one another above ourselves. In other words, you are more important to me than I am to me. Your needs are supposed to take precedent. I am to give myself to you. You are to give yourself to one another to the best of our ability, devoted to and honoring in brotherly love one another. Paul also said in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, carry, I love that verb, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. One of the ways we carry burdens of one another is to pray for each other, correct? We are to pray for one another, to lift one another up. When we hear news of something that is happening that is troubling you, we are to pray for one another and to do all that we can to help one another. And then in Galatians chapter 6, I love verse number 10. Paul says, therefore, as we have opportunity. I'll stop right there for just a moment. We have to be paying attention to no opportunity, correct? Correct. Somebody might say, well, I haven't had any opportunity today, Mike. I'm like, no, you have. You just haven't been paying attention. I've been there. I've done that. I've not paid attention. And so I know what it's like to live oblivious to all the things around me. But again, back to Galatians 6 and verse 10. As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Are you ready for this? Especially to those who belong to the family of the believers. In other words, there's a fringe benefit to being a part of the church. Because as I have opportunity, the Bible tells me to do good to all people, especially to those in the family of believers. There are fringe benefits. Won't you come and join us? If you're with us online, invite you to be a part of our church. You'll get preferential treatment then. How about that? That's the way we to treat one another. That's what the scripture tells us to do. Now let us come to Numbers 3 and 4 on your outline where I said I wanted to come back to how Jesus loved us through such pain and agony. It's going to get a little harder. Are you ready? If we want to love like Jesus did, and that's the big idea for us, then number three for us is this. I must see others' pain even when I am in pain. I must be able to recognize, I must be looking for, I must notice the pain of others, even with the pain that I carry, even with what I'm trying to deal with and understand and overcome on my own. I've talked to a lot of people, you may have heard this before yourself, people say, well, this is the decision I'm going to make in my life because God wants me to be happy. I don't want to burst your bubble today, but God does not care so much about how happy you are. 
God is not up in heaven giving you a gift like we do at Christmas going, oh, I hope he likes it. I hope he's happy with it. That's not what God does. Now, there's nothing wrong with our happiness. We will find joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. But God is more concerned with you being conformed to the likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ, than He is concerned about your happiness. Therefore, if we are going to learn to love like Jesus did, I have to learn to see other people's pain even when I am in pain. Y'all know what I mean. We all carry our own burdens. We all carry our own life situations. None of us are immune to the troubles of life. But I believe the scripture is clear that we are to look beyond those as much as we can and see the pain that others are in so that we can walk alongside them and meet them. In Philippians chapter 2, in verse number 5, it simply says this that your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. If my attitude is going to be like Christ Jesus, I go back to the cross, I go back to John chapter 19 where we began today, and the attitude of Christ was that in the incredible agony and pain that he was in was to think about others. That still blows my mind. That he can be experiencing things that we will never know. We will never know these things. And yet he saw my need above his own. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2 verse 21, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He has set the standard. He has given us the perfect template of how to be. I must see others' pain even when I am in pain. And let's move to number four. The final one on your outline is this. Ultimately then, not just seeing it, but I must meet others' needs. Are you ready for this? Even if mine aren't. I must meet the needs of others even if mine go unmet. That doesn't sound all that fun, does it? I mean, let's just be honest. I, I'm honest. I want my needs met. I want my hurts and pains away. And I, I want someone to pray over me. And I want all those things. We all do. We're human. But here's the point. I must meet other needs. I must. If I'm going to love like Jesus, I must be about His work and do all I can to meet the needs of others, even if mine are not. Jesus on the cross doing the greatest work ever, imaginable. And we are so grateful, back to the song, that he would save a wretch like me. The needs are great, dying for our sins. And he offers prayer. God, would you forgive them? They do not, they do not know what they're doing. Oh yes, you've expressed faith in me. Today you will be with me in paradise. And listen, John, you take care of mom. Mom, he's going to take care of you. And y'all are going to do these things. How could Jesus feel this way? How could Jesus do this? I know He was God. I know He is God. But here's the answer. Others were more important to Him. There is nothing that's more counterculture today than that thought. And this may be why the church today is not seeing enough push into our communities the way it should because we're thinking too much, possibly, of ourselves versus others. I just offer that as a possibility. It's a thought that we must consider. Because if people are feeling or if people are experiencing the love of God through the church, then I think we would see a greater penetration of the church into communities everywhere. Lostness would would be going down and believers would be growing. But I just wonder if others are seeing that or sensing that. Let me ask you a question. And I'm going to set you up. Are you ready? I always like to tell people I'm setting you up. Do you think Jesus loves you? There's only one answer to that question, right? And you, you've been set up, right? Well, let me ask you this. If we are to love like Jesus loves, would others say about you 
what others say about me, that they are loved by you. That is the law of Christ today, that we love like Jesus did. Let me give you one last thought that's not on your outline. If you have your Bible still open to John chapter 19, after Jesus had said, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, which is John, he couldn't put his own name in there, here is your mother. Notice what the last words of verse 27 say. It says, From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. A simple, no questions, no negotiations, no hesitation, no argument or reasoning about, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Jesus, what about... His? None of that. Just a simple submission, a simple surrender, a simple obedience that gives us a great example of loving like Jesus has commanded. That's what the church is called to. This is one of the greatest gifts that he has given to us in just very simple words to his precious mother and to the disciple that's been called the beloved disciple, John. Take care of one another. Bless one another. Love one another. Show a deep affection and bond to one another. And so to you as a church, to a dear church to me, the church family that we call home, this is what God's called us to. To love one another especially, but to offer this love to all mankind as much as we can. If you're listening to us online today and you've stayed with me all the way to the end, I invite you to know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ today. His love for you is as real as it's ever been. And the love of this church is as good as you'll ever find on planet earth. I invite you. I invite you to know Jesus Christ today. I invite you to be a part of our church. I invite you to be a part of the family of God called Parkview. I, I, you know, I just, there's some Sundays I feel like I miss this. But I cannot miss a Sunday without inviting you first and foremost to Jesus. And secondly, be a part of what God is doing in our church. Be a part of this kind of community. Be a part of this kind of family. And tonight, I encourage you once again. I know some of our groups tonight are not going to meet because there's sickness involved in a couple of them. If you're a part of those groups and you need to be somewhere where there's a group, there's one in this room here tonight at 6 o'clock. If you need to know of other groups that you can be a part of, ask me before you leave today. Uh, you may know some of them. Call them. See if you can come to their group. I'm sure they'll welcome you in. You need to talk about some of these things tonight. It's on our list to talk about because I believe it will be life-changing in your group and in your life to learn to love like Jesus did. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the fact that you are so good to us. Lord, that you love us in such an amazing way. Lord, again, back to the song that Rosemary sang, that you would love us so much that you would save wretches like Mike Fortenberry, sinful to the core, but yet you love me enough to pay my penalty and to make a way for me to be in right relationship with you, the Father, because of what he's done through my faith. Lord, I pray today that there would be those who have listened to this message that has never expressed fully their faith in you. They've never fully put their trust in what you've done. And that today they would. Today, Lord, they would be born again, as the Scripture says. That today they would know fully, for the first time in their life, that they have trusted you for the forgiveness of their sin, in your shed blood, in your work on the cross of Calvary. 
Lord, if there's anybody that is listening to this message and still listening to this prayer right now, Lord, if they have thought about the fact that because they are a church member or because their mama was a good Christian or their granddaddy was a preacher or whatever the case may be, Lord, that that doesn't mean a thing. Father, we all will stand before you individually not on the coattails of another family member or because my name was on some role on a church uh, membership on this planet Earth. But Lord, apart from a saving relationship with you, full trust in what you've done, Lord, they have not come to know you and that today they will. Lord, it does not matter if they have to say, well, I've been a member of a church, but now I want to be saved. Then, then Lord, let them be saved today. Let them come to know you because your love puts you on the cross to do this very thing for us, this most incredible thing filled with pain and agony that we will never, ever know so that we could know you and walk with you for all eternity. Lord, I pray that there would be those today that would say yes to you and that on this day, March 14th, 2021, they could say this was the day that I was born again, giving my life to the Lord Jesus Christ fully and finally. Lord, we love you. Thank you for that kind of love for us that would save us from our sin. And Lord, I know that you've called us to that kind of love. May we be about your business. Father, may we put aside all these arguments. May we put aside all these debates about theologies, Father, that so much of them have no bearing whatsoever on life itself. But Lord, may we give ourselves to the practical application of the word. And that is to love like you have loved us. Thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you for your church. And Lord, I pray you'll bless us as we seek to live for you, as we seek to impact this community and infiltrate its very, all its recesses, Lord, with the love of Jesus Christ. May we show the love that you've given to us. May we be Jesus. May we be the hands and feet that you've called us to be. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A few quick announcements this morning. Remember, today is Mr. Wayne Colson's funeral. Uh, for those that have agreed to be pallbearers, um, we will need you here around 1.20. You can go home and come back for the funeral at 3 a little later. And, and also, all the deacons that are available, they'd love for you to come and be an honorary pallbearer. Um, next Sunday, I mean, next Saturday is the memorial service for Miss Glenda Thompson. Uh, it's at 11 o'clock, and there is going to be lunch to follow, but they would like for you to RSVP, if you will, so they'll know how many's coming. Uh, remember, young people, uh, the sign up for D now, uh, it, well, at March 19th, the price goes up to sign up. So be sure that you sign up before March 19th. This is for our young people going to Panama City April 9th through the 11th. If you have any questions about that, feel free to call or ask Jamie Dover. Uh, remember, at each exit as we leave, entrance or exit, there's a basket. If you, if you have your offering, you need to drop that off in the basket. Uh, uh, Mike mentioned our discipleship groups meeting tonight. Uh, again, uh, just encourage you to be involved in one of them. Deacons, we're meeting tomorrow night. Uh, at 6 o'clock, and we'll meet here in the sanctuary. Um, and listen, I, again, I feel like I do this every week. I just want to tell you, bear with us with the, with the ropes and the seating and all that kind of stuff. Hopefully all this will go away soon. Today's message was a good message about that. You know, we're, we're doing, a lot of us are doing some things that we do not want to do. Your deacons did not want to do it, but we feel like we was doing it to honor other people. Uh, as we dismiss, again, these against this wall will slide out this door down the hall and out the joiner door. These on this wall will come out and out this little side, the handicap door. Those in the middle in the balcony, if you'll just kind of exit out that back door. And again, just kind of try to stay socially distanced till you get outside. We would appreciate that. Uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for our time together today. Thank you for the practical things that are in your word, Lord. Thank you for the love of Jesus Christ, uh, Lord. If we, could put, if we could manage to put that on, uh, this place would be filled every single Sunday. So help us in that. Be with our groups tonight as we meet and help us grow to be more like you in Jesus' name. Amen.